Today, I'm going to speak to you about the last 30 years of architectural history. That's a lot to pack into 18 minutes. It's a complex topic, so we're just going to dive right in at a complex place. Because architecture is not about math, and it's not about zoning. It's about those visceral, emotional connections that we feel to the places that we occupy. And it's no surprise that we feel that way, because according to the EPA, Americans spend 90% of their time indoors. That's 90% of our time surrounded by architecture. That's huge. That means that architecture is shaping us in ways that we didn't even realize. That makes us a little bit gullible and very, very predictable. It means that when I show you a building like this, I know what you think. You think power and stability and democracy. And I know you think that because it's based on a building that was built 2,500 years ago by the Greeks. This is a trick. This is a trigger that architects use to get you to create an emotional connection to the forms that we build our buildings out of. It's a predictable emotional connection. And we've been using this trick for a long, long time. We used it 300 years ago to build banks. We used it in the 19th century to build art museums. And in the 20th century in America, we used it to build houses. And look at these solid, stable little soldiers facing the ocean and keeping away the elements. This is really, really useful because building things is terrifying. It's expensive. It takes a long time, and it's very complicated. And the people that build things, developers and governments, they're naturally afraid of innovation, and they'd rather just use those forms that they know you'll respond to. That's how we end up with buildings like this. This is a nice building. This is the Livingston Public Library that was completed in 2004 in my hometown. And, you know, it's got a dome, and it's got this round thing, and columns, red brick. And you can kind of, you know, you can kind of guess what Livingston's trying to say with this building. Children, property values, and history. But it doesn't have much to do with what a library actually does today. That same year, in 2004, on the other side of the country, another library was completed, and it looks like this. It's in Seattle. This library is about how we consume media in a digital age. It's about a new kind of public amenity for the city, a place to gather and read and share. So how is it possible that in the same year, in the same country, two buildings, both called libraries, look so completely different? And the answer is that architecture works on the principle of a pendulum. On the one side is innovation. And architects are constantly pushing, pushing for new technologies, new typologies, new solutions for the way that we live today. And we push and we push and we push until, until we completely alienate all of you. We have to go to the other side and re-engage those symbols that we know you love. So we do that, and you're happy. We feel like sellouts. So we start experimenting again, and we push the pendulum back and back and forth and back and forth. We've gone for the last 300 years and certainly for the last 30 years. Okay, 30 years ago. We were coming out of the 70s. Architects had been busy experimenting with something called brutalism. It's about concrete. <laughs> you can guess this. Small windows, dehumanizing scale. This is really tough stuff. So as we get closer to the 80s, we start to re-engage those symbols. We push the pendulum back into the other direction. We take these forms that we know you love, and we update them. We add neon, and we add pastels, and we use new materials, and you love it. And we can't give you enough of it. We take Chippendale armoires, and we turn those into skyscrapers. And skyscrapers can be medieval castles made out of glass. Forms got big, forms got bold and colorful, dwarves became columns, and we start pushing the pendulum back into the other direction. In the late 80s and early 90s, we start experimenting with something called deconstructivism. We throw out historical symbols, we rely on new computer-aided design techniques, 
and we come up with new compositions, forms crashing into forms. This is academic and heady stuff. It's super unpopular. We totally alienate you. Ordinarily, the pendulum would just swing back into the other direction, and then something amazing happened. In 1997, this building opened. This is the Guggenheimville Bow by Frank Gehry. And this building fundamentally changes the world's relationship to architecture. Paul Goldberger said that Bill Bow was one of those rare moments when critics, academics, and the general public were completely united around a building. The New York Times called this building a miracle. Tourism in Bilbao increased 2,500% after this building was completed. So all of a sudden, everybody wants one of these buildings. LA, Seattle, Chicago, New York, Cleveland. How is it possible that they become so ubiquitous throughout the world? And it happened because media so successfully galvanized around them that they quickly taught us that these forms mean culture and tourism. We created an emotional reaction to these forms. So did every mayor in the world. So every mayor knew that if they had these forms, they had culture, and tourism. This phenomenon at the turn of the new millennium happened to a few other architects. It happened to Zaha, and it happened to Liebeskind. And what happened to these elite few architects at the turn of the new millennium could actually start to happen to the entire field of architecture as digital media starts to increase the speed with which we consume information. Because think about how you consume architecture. A thousand years ago, you would have had to have walked to the village next door to see a building. Transportation speeds up. You can take a boat, you can take a plane, you can be a tourist. Technology speeds up. You can see it in the newspaper, on TV, until finally, we're all architectural photographers. And the building has become disembodied from the site. Architecture is everywhere now. And that means that the speed of communication has finally caught up to the speed of architecture. Because architecture actually moves quite quickly. It doesn't take long to think about a building. It takes a long time to build a building, three or four years. And in the interim, an architect will design two or eight or a hundred other buildings before they know if that building that they designed 40 years ago was a success or not. That's because there's never been a good feedback loop in architecture. That's how we end up with buildings like this. Brutalism wasn't a two-year movement. It was a 20-year movement. For 20 years, we were producing buildings like this because we had no idea how much you hated it. It's never going to happen again, I think. <laughs> because we are living on the verge of the greatest revolution in architecture since the invention of concrete, of steel, or of the elevator. And it's a media revolution. So my theory is that when you apply media to this pendulum, it starts swinging faster and faster until it's at both extremes nearly simultaneously. And that effectively blurs the difference between innovation and symbol, between us the architects, and you, the public. Now we can make nearly instantaneous, emotionally charged symbols out of something that's brand new. Think for a second about those librarians back in Livingston. If that building was going to be built today, the first thing they would do is go online and search new libraries. They would be bombarded by examples of experimentation, of innovation, of pushing at the envelope, of what a library can be. That's ammunition. That's ammunition that they can take with them to the mayor of Livingston, to the people of Livingston, and say there's no one answer to what a library is today. Let's be a part of this. This abundance of experimentation gives them the freedom to run their own experiment. Everything is different now. 
architects are no longer these mysterious creatures that use big words and complicated drawings, and you aren't the hapless public, the consumer that won't accept anything that they haven't seen anymore. Architects can hear you, and you're not intimidated by architecture. That means that that pendulum swinging back and forth from style to style, from movement to movement, is irrelevant. We can actually move forward and find relevant solutions to the problems that our society faces. This is the end of architectural history, and it means that the buildings of tomorrow are going to look a lot different than the buildings of today. It doesn't matter how we build; it matters what we build. Architects already know how to make buildings that are greener and smarter and friendlier. We've just been waiting for all of you to want them. And finally, we're not on opposite sides anymore. Find an architect, hire an architect, work with us to design better buildings, better cities, and a better world. Because the stakes are high. Buildings don't just reflect our society; they shape our society. Down to the smallest spaces, the local libraries, the homes where we raise our children, and the walk that they take from the bedroom to the bathroom. Thank you.